Well, 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 welcome back. Chapter 11, Code School. Final graduation day came. Let's get it. Code Talker by Joseph Bruchak, published by the Penguin Group. Please excuse any mispronunciation of the Navajo language. I'll try our best, please. Chapter 11, Code School. Finally, graduation day came. Our all Navajo 297th platoon finished with the highest honors of all the recruits at boot camp. We held ourselves tall and proud in the uniforms of privates for our graduation photograph. I did not know what would happen next. In a few days, I might be shipped off to the Pacific to fight the Japanese, as other Marines were already doing on the island of Guadalcanal. I'd been reading about the heroic deeds in the Chevron, the Marine Corps camp newspaper. Or I might be trained for some special duty here in the United States. There were only two things of which I was certain. The first was that I was now a real leatherneck. Okay. That, grandchildren, is another name for a Marine. Like jarhead. It was a good nickname to remind us and everyone else that Marines have always been the toughest of all the armed forces who fight for America. The second thing of which I was certain was now was that I was now ready for anything. Many years later, I know I was right about the first thing. We Navajo Marines were tough and determined, perhaps even more so than most of the non-Indian Marines who later served by our sides. Why was this so? It may have been because we remembered the suffering and courage of our grandfathers who fought as warriors to protect our land and our people. We were not just fighting for the United States. We were going into battle for our Navajo people our families, and our sacred land. Let's go. However, as far as that second idea, that we Navajos are ready for anything, we were surely wrong about that. It is true that we Navajos gained a reputation for being especially tough in combat. When the Navajo was wounded in battle, he did not moan or cry out the way many of the other men around us did. He suffered in silence, waiting quietly for help to come to him. This was something we had learned from our elders. They had taught us that in battle, you must never give away to the enemy either your weakness or your location. But even though we were prepared for pain, we were not ready for what happened to us next. We were about to enter eight weeks of the strangest training any Marine in World War II had to go through. In fact, what they asked of us Navajos after we finished boot camp was so unusual and unexpected that many of us thought at first we were the victims of some kind of mean joke. 297th, pack your gear, you're shipping out. That is what the sergeant barked into our barracks the day after our graduation photo was taken. That was the last thing we had expected. It was Sunday. All of the non-Indian Marines who had been in boot camp with us were leaving on furloughs. They were laughing and joking with each other as they headed for the gate to see friends and family or just go into town and have fun. But not us Navajos. Some of those lucky guys, like my friend Georgia Boy, waved to us as our bus roared through the gate. I smiled and waved back at him, but my smile was, as uncer- was an uncertain one. Why were we 67 Indians being sent out this way to some destination no one would tell us about? Were we finally going to begin that important but secret task only we Navajos would accomplish? Or was this some kind of punishment? Our trip wasn't long at all. They took us to Camp Elliott, a little north of San Diego. We were checked into our new barracks without a word of explanation about what we were going to do there. I didn't sleep well at all that night. At seven the next morning, several non-coms, who were to be our escorts, arrived at our barracks. In military language, grandchildren, a non-com is a non-commissioned officer, anyone above the rank of a private, but no higher than a sergeant. We were lined up, put through roll call, and then marched off to breakfast. I could hardly eat, and a lot of the other guys were just as nervous as I was, picking at their food. As soon as we had finished, we were rounded up again and quick marched to a building with bars on all the windows and a strong door that our escorts unlocked and opened. Inside, the escort sergeant barked. Ah, they are taking us to jail, Henry Bahe whispered to me just before we went through the door. He meant it as a joke, but I didn't laugh. My heart was beating faster. What was happening? 
As soon as we were inside, the escort sergeant shut the barred door and locked it behind him, leaving the rest of the Marines, who had escorted us outside on guard. Then he led us down a long hall to another locked door. It opened to a classroom, much like the ones I had sat in for endless hours at Indian boarding school. The blackboards, the rough wooden floor, the uncomfortable looking chairs were almost exactly the same. Our escort, who had not set foot into the room, shut the door, and once again I heard the sound of a lock clicking. All that had happened to that point was strange, grandchildren, but it was not as strange as the words I then heard spoken to us from the front of the classroom. Be quiet, be seated. All of us Navajos turned immediately to look. Those words had been spoken in our native language. There, at the front of the class, stood two Navajo men wearing the uniforms of Marines. One of them I recognized at once. It was Johnny Manuelito. This is Corporal Johnny Manuelito. I am Corporal John Benali, said the second Navajo man, who stood in front of us speaking in, Eng in English. We will be your instructors. I was stunned. The idea of a Navajo being a teacher was new to me. Yes, grandchildren, I know that many of your teachers are Navajos now, but it was different back then. Johnny Manuelito and John Benali passed out pencils and blank sheets of paper and then went to the front of the room by the blackboards. I was so amazed by all that was happening that I do not recall being handed a pencil and paper, but somehow I found them in my hands. Follow our instructions exactly, Johnny Manuelito said. We will speak words in Navajo. You must write down those same words on your paper in English. He turned toward John Benali, who held a piece of chalk in one hand and an eraser in the other. Walichi, Johnny Manuelito said. I looked up in surprise as he said it, then realized he was not looking my way and using my nickname. He was just speaking the word for ant. In large block letters, John Benali printed the word ant on the blackboard. As soon as everyone had seen it, he erased it. Now it is your turn, Johnny Manuelito said. We speak in Navajo, you write in English, just as Corporal Bonali just did. Be sure to print in block letters. He paused, looked out at all of us, then nodded. Walichi, he said. Shash, said John Bonali. Mosai, bye, za, my, ant, bear, cat, deer, elk. Fox. I put those words down on the paper, but they were speaking so fast that I missed the next few words and could only try to catch up as they continued on. Dibi Yaji, Nats Osai, Nashi, Nash Ja, Lamb, Mouse, Nut, Owl, printed. By the time I stopped talking, I had printed 16 words, but I still didn't know what this was all about. I glanced around the room. From the looks on the faces of my other platoon mates, they were all confused. Henry Baha'i looked as if he was angry. Jimmy King, who was one of the hardest workers of all of us, was shaking his head. Johnny Manuelito and John Benali went around the room collecting the papers. They looked quickly through the stack and then carefully placed them in a box at the front of the room. You have done well, Johnny Manuelito said, but you must learn to be perfect if you wish to become a code talker. Hmm? Code talker. talker. It was the first time I'd ever heard that name, but it sounded good to me. Then our two Navajo instructors began to explain our duties to us. The more they said, the better it sounded. Our job was to learn a new top secret code based on the Navajo language. We would also be trained to be expert in every form of communication used by the Marine Corps, from radios to Morse code. Using our code, we could send battlefield messages that no one but another Navajo code talker could understand. I realized right away that our job was a really important one. In order to win battles, Marines needed to communicate fast at long distances. In those days before computers, that meant using radio. However, anyone, including the Japanese, could listen to our radio messages. To keep messages secret, the Marines sent them in a code but the Japanese broke every code our American forces used. A new kind of code had to be created. 
During World War I, our country had used other Indians, Cherokees, and Chickasaws to send messages in their own language to confuse the enemy. After the war, the Japanese had decided to be prepared for something like that if they had to fight America. They sent people to America to learn not only how to speak English fluently, but also to learn our American Indian languages. Navajo, though, had never been studied. It was one of the hardest of all American Indian languages to learn. Only we Navajos could speak it with complete fluency. Also, because there were so many of us, including hundreds of young Navajo men who had learned to speak English in boarding schools, our language was chosen for making that unbreakable code. Where did the idea of using Navajo come from? There was a white man named Philip Johnson who was the son of a white trader on the reservation. And so he could speak trader Navajo. He liked our people and had Navajo friends. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, he brought some of his Navajo friends to the Marines in San Diego to demonstrate how our language could be used to send messages. An important Marine had already been thinking about making an Indian code. His name was Major General Clinton Vogel, commanding general of the amphibious division of the Pacific Task Force. He knew that the U.S. Army was already using Comanches in Europe to send messages in their own language. After hearing of Philip Johnson's demonstration, General Vogel authorized the recruitment of that first class of 29 Navajo Marines. Just like us, they were brought to Camp Elliott, where they were locked in the same classroom and told to develop an unbreakable code. Those Navajos did it all by themselves. Some have said that Philip Johnson developed the code and taught it to the Navajos. That is not true. He did not know our sacred language well enough to do this. He was nowhere near Camp Elliott during the summer of 1942, when the code was being created by Navajos. Later on, Philip Johnson came to work, on camp, came to work at camp, camp Elliott. His job, with the rank of sergeant, was to be an administrator for the school, help things run well, and write reports. He could not speak the code and never taught it to anyone. Mm -hmm. Legacy history.